Well, hello everyone. This is Dr. Song of New Covenant Academy. Today, um, I have Pastor Ted here with me, and uh, we're going to talk about five essential elements of highly effective students. So students who are high achieving uh, students, high achievers academically and socially and just all around, mm -hmm. uh, we've seen students do well when they have these five elements down. Right. So we want to talk about that today. And the first item that we want to uh, talk about is the, uh, the physical fitness. And we're not talking about being an athlete, but we're mm -hmm. talking about being uh, physically fit. Mm -hmm. So both of us know a little bit about uh -huh. sports and being physically fit because you, well, tell us a little bit about your, your athletic background. <laughs> uh, this is the <laughs> story, right? When I was in high school, you know, I was an athlete. Well, um, that was my main focus in high school. It was in academics. And I had offers to play football at D1 schools, uh, choose to go into ministry. Uh, so I'm not fit now, but I used to be a pretty good looking dude, pretty fit. So I know still a thing or two about, uh, you know, eating well, sleeping well and exercising. So yeah, definitely. It's yeah. ironic that when we think about a student, we only think about the mental or the academic. Or the academic side. Yeah. But strangely, the, the baseline is probably uh, physical fitness. Yeah. I, I think it, we should never separate our entire existence into just academics or just right. mental or just spiritual or just physical because it's, yeah. it's all intertwined, right? Yeah. I mean, you're a pastor, so you deal with things like this. Healthy bodies allow you to do healthy things. Right. Healthy mindset allows you to do healthy things. Yeah. Um, I think healthy spiritual life also yeah. contributes to... Uh, high performance at school or work or wherever right. you go. So physical fitness we think is very important and we try to promote that at our school not only through physical education but also especially for our high school students who are not required to take four years of PE but only two mm -hmm. and that's the requirements and, mm -hmm. and, and requirement and our students seem to just want to do that and, and no more mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's a problem right because mm -hmm. that's all they want to do. Yeah, I mean as we are on the older side, we realize... Well, speak for yourself, but yeah. that's okay. We, we, we realize the, uh, the, the need for yeah, uh, yeah. being fit. Yeah. Um, I'm getting ready to go on vacation. Are you exercising? You know. And I realize I need to exercise to go on vacation. Because uh, my wife planned out yeah. hiking and sightseeing. And, you know, I get winded going up the stairs in my house. And I said, uh-oh, I better get, get in shape. Yeah. And uh, I think one thing that I do want to point out is being physically fit doesn't necessarily mean, like you said, like being in shape for athletics. Yeah. I think um, sleeping well, yeah. eating well uh, helps you become effective in the things that you do. One of the problems that I find in our kids, not only they're not in shape physically, but they don't get enough sleep, right? And they don't eat right, right? You know, and I'm guilty of them not eating right because uh, <clears throat> I give them candy and uh, junk food at school, right? Because you're feeding them boba all the time, so yeah, here's part of the problem right there. <laughs> I am definitely part of the problem, but um, yeah, sleeping, yeah. eating right, uh, staying off the computer games right. until late right. into the night. Those things are all important. And even when students uh, study, what I tell them is that uh, there's a research that shows that you have to study in intervals. You can't continue to study for two to four hours straight. There's no, nobody who could have that much right. of attention span. So what I really recommend our students to do, and parents, maybe you could enforce mm -hmm. this at home, is to study for 15 to 20 minutes, mm -hmm. focus and concentrate, and take a five-minute break where you get, you get up, mm -hmm. You know, you stretch. I tell our student athletes to do push-ups and sit-ups and then re-engage. You, you, you need the blood to flow into your brain because your blood carries oxygen to your brain. And if you're not uh, replenishing that, that blood and oxygen, you're going to fall asleep and you're going to feel sleepy. And then your posture starts gets a little sloppy and then you feel even more tired. <laughs> God forbid, while you're studying, you put some snack into your body and, you know, your blood's going to go to your stomach to do the mm -hmm. digestion there. So all these things come into play. So we're talking mm -hmm. about really healthy lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, that what you're talking about 
is based on study. I can give you an example. Uh, the denomination I belong to, we have an annual convention, and the evening session goes on sometimes for three, three mm. and a half hours. Yeah. So before, we used to have one keynote speaker, and he would go for an hour and a half. And how many zombies and, or dead and bodies there? Everybody's falling yeah. asleep or, or not really paying attention. Right, right. The studies show that in an hour and a half session, you're only retaining about 15 to 20 minutes right. of information. So they consulted a um, firm that specializes in putting together conventions. And they suggested that not, n not to have one keynote speak for an hour and a mm -hmm. half, mm -hmm. but break down the speaking to about 15 to 20 minute right. interviews, different speakers, and even the main speakers given only 20 minutes right. uh, so that it's broken up. Yeah. So they show videos. They have interviews, they have short talks with like three people going for 15 minutes. So I find it personally a lot more, lot more uh, effective. Yeah. I feel like I'm engaged better. I retain a whole lot more. Uh, and so that's the trend. That's, that's based yeah. on study. I agree. I think that's why classrooms have to also vary. Uh, in the past, it was teachers who were lecturing for 30, 40 minutes, but kids mm -hmm. fall asleep. So we're trying to use multi-sensory uh, learning and, and instructional strategies. Right. So sometimes there will be peer conversations. Sometimes mm -hmm. there will be note-taking. Then we use videos. Mm -hmm. Then we use audios. And then teachers lecture. So, uh, so going back to uh, physical fitness, mm -hmm. just want to summarize that section. We could probably have a completely separate uh, right. podcast on this one, but we need students who are physically fit. Um, quite honestly, in the last 30 years of my career, I do not think I've seen more than a handful of students who are high performers at school, but who are, say, rather obese. Um, I think most students who are active and fit and well-rounded uh, do fairly well at, at school, too, because they're not tired. Uh, they're not always hungry. And they know how to manage their time, which kind of ties into one of the things that we want to talk about uh, uh, down the line. Anything else you want to add to the physical fitness component? No. I mean, it's one of those things that's ironically important in being an effective student. Yeah. yeah. And um, if I may add, may add one thing is a lot of times students say that, oh, you know what, I'll do it after I do this or after once the exam is over I'll get in shape mm -hmm. or once the summer's over or once the school's out. Mm -hmm. um, I think the psychology tells us that sometimes you have to put your body in action for your mind to catch up to it. Uh, you don't, you shouldn't be just thinking about it and then uh, I'll do it when I'm, when I'm ready. It's sometimes you just got to do it uh, and yes. when you get into the habit of doing it your body or your and your mind adjust to to, to the, mm -hmm. the habit that your body is used to. So hopefully our students and parents will focus on physical fitness uh, of our children, especially this school mm -hmm. year. Um, as we progress into the school year, uh, kids are gonna complain about more work and you know, I gotta stay up late, especially our high school students and IV mm -hmm. students, and they're gonna say, I can't sleep because I gotta do this. Mm -hmm. Well, they need to rest, they need to sleep, they need to eat well, cut down the junk food, mm -hmm. uh, go easy on the fries, I'm guilty, I, I'm just guilty when it comes to fries because I can't kick it. But go easy, you know, maybe once a week or something. Mm -hmm. And just take care of yourself. And when you take care of your body, it will take care of your mind and heart and soul as well. Right. Um, then the next item that we want to talk about for the, uh, the five essen essential elements of high achieving students is motivation. Now, this is a big topic. Mm -hmm. um, some students are uh, motivated enough to push themselves and go through, say, sports or mm -hmm. studies or what have you. But motivation is such a large topic that this is not something that we could put our finger on exactly. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the fact that uh, research shows that internalizing external uh, stimuli or motivation mm -hmm. is what children need? Because they're not sufficiently motivated by themselves to right. push for a goal because they don't even know what the goal or purpose mm -hmm. in life is. Right. So they, they need that kind of stimulus from adults around them. And sure. that's what we try to do. We tell sure. our kids, hey, maybe this or maybe that, mm -hmm. or you seem to be really good at this, or God mm -hmm. seems to, God seemed to have 
I've given you certain talent here. Those kind of encouragements are, mm -hmm. are needed for the children to internalize the motivation. Right, because most of them have unhealthy motivation. Mm. When I ask them, I do a lot of <laughs> counseling, and I ask them, hey, so why is studies important? Their number one response is because of my mom and dad. They're going to get upset if I don't do well. And oftentimes they come to me and say, Pastor Ted, I can't get a B in this class. Can you talk to the teachers for me? I said, B is not a bad thing, right? You learn from it, you grow from it. And they would usually tell me, Pastor, you don't understand. I can't get a B. And this is a funny story. One of the uh, children said, I can't get a B in Korean. I said, oh, do you have like, she was ethnically Korean. So I thought she had pride in the fact that she was Korean and didn't want to get a bad grade, although B is not the end of the world. Um, so I said, why? Because you want to go to Korea and talk to your extended family members? They go, no, because my parents told me, you're Korean. If you get a B, that's the worst thing that can happen. And uh, so she needed an A. And uh, the story is she didn't get an A. I didn't go to bat for her because she had 82 percentile. And there's no way to pull it up to an A, Dr. Sam. I mean, you know, but the world didn't end for her. She's adjusted. She's, she's a great adult now. Uh, so unhealthy motivation of, well, I'm going to get in trouble doesn't help. Or, or yeah. even if it's positive, it could, uh -huh. it's, as you said, it's unhealthy in the sense that uh -huh. if earning a high mark or grade is the motivation behind mm -hmm. studies, uh, I, I think the students are missing the point. What right. I try to tell the students is that, and this is what I told my own two kids, mm -hmm. if you give your very best and you get an F, I'm going to be there, I'm going to clap well, for Maybe you. not an F. But well, uh, you know. You, <laughs> I know what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> but if you get a B or even an A without trying, yes. is that really worthy of praise? or worthy of recognition, right? Mm -hmm. We live in a day and age when everybody gets a medal for showing up. Yeah. Everybody gets a ribbon for participating. I think yeah. th there's, there's no motivation if you're not going to win or you're going to sh shoot for the right goal. Uh, but not to go off on the tangent, but so we as adults and parents and teachers mm -hmm. have to give our children the opportunity to be motivated rather right. than saying, you should be motivated. because. Mm -hmm. They're selfish individuals, right? Young mm -hmm. children. So if they're going to be motivated at young age, they're going to be motivated about playing computer games or mm -hmm. Nintendo or, you know, mm -hmm. online games or hanging out with friends or maybe even sports. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to be sufficiently motivated enough for right. what's really beneficial and good for them. Yeah. So we know as mentors and parents what's a healthy motivation. Like you said, they ha the students have to see it for themselves and internalize yeah. it. So... In the home and at the school, we need to partner together to let the kids know, let the kids have time to hear us out and see why it's important. And it takes time and it takes conversation. Um, and uh, what we found, Dr. Song, you will agree with me, is that we have a harder time getting kids to be rightfully motivated in the ninth and 10th grade. Mm. They're all about mechanical <clears throat> things like getting good grades, uh, pleasing parents, doing my homework on time. But what we found in, through many years of experience with our students, by the time they turn juniors, mm -hmm. seniors, they see the bigger picture. And I think that's a byproduct, not to pat ourselves on the back, byproduct of our teachers and the mentors at the school that gives them opportunity to really think about yeah. what truly is important and what should motivate them. And, and as a Christian school, we're really not just promoting academic excellence. And I think that's part of our ministry, absolutely, because mm -hmm. we're a college prep school. Uh, we mm -hmm. have fantastic results. But even in college counseling meetings, one of the things I always ask the students and parents is, do you want to go to college? Mm -hmm. And sometimes parents are like, why are you asking that? We've been here for 12 years. How, how can you ask that? I go, <laughs> you, you need to ask that. Is the student sufficiently motivated enough on mm -hmm. his own to go to college because mm -hmm. I don't want him or her to do a favor to mom and dad and say, well, I'm yeah. going to college because that's what they expect me to do. Sure. No, you, you will not be motivated. And especially when those students go to college, they may be living on campus by themselves mm -hmm. and they don't have any other motivators outside and surrounding mm -hmm. them. So they mm -hmm. may easily give up. Yeah. And, and, and we've seen 
data showing that more and more students are giving up, uh, quitting college for both good and bad reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but they shouldn't be quitting because they're not motivated and they never wanted to be there in the first place. Yeah. I, myself, I made a small error in uh, guiding my, my son. My oldest son is now 28, proud graduate of New Covenant right, Academy, right. Uh, doing really well. Uh, but when he was deciding on a major at college for his undergrad, I steered him to computer information systems. Here, here's a wrong motivation for me. I thought, well, he'll always have a job, right? Because everything is based on information and computers. So he was a good son, and uh, he got a, a degree, Bachelor of Science in Computer Information System, finished in the top of his class, uh, has a great right. relationship mm -hmm. with the, uh, the professor, yeah. uh, who he still gets recommendations from. But his heart wasn't in it. Mm. So when he graduated, he came back here to work. Right, right. And do you, did you know that the job that he ate most when he was here was doing IT? Right, related to computer yeah. stuff. Uh, he did a whole lot of other things, yeah. but what he really enjoyed was the administration aspect of school running. So I guided him wrong. Dr. Song guided him right, <laughs> told him, hey, you need to go get an MBA, right? So my son has an MBA that stresses uh, in um, nonprofit organizations. Right, right. Um, and now he's working as an administrator for a, a company that, that, that works with the government and things like that. And that was his cup of tea. Yeah. But I motivated him, hey, you're going to have a job. Go get your computer science degree. Mm. Now, that wasn't all hurtful, right? It became a basis for which he can right, further his right. studies. But, yeah, so I was so glad that uh, he was steered in the right way uh, later on in his life, found out what he wanted to do, yeah. business administration, and he's earning a lot more money than we are. So that <laughs> should say something about uh, being kind of connecting, yeah. say, passion and, and being motivated on his right, own. Right, right. He's doing well, meaning he's happy at his job. He's earning a great living. Mm. Uh, and I'm proud of that for him not only being our son, my son, but also a graduate of this school. Well, I consider uh, him my son, too. Yeah. But. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he spent more time at the songs than my house in certain <laughs> days, so um, certainly. So, you know, those are some of the things yeah. that we need to really focus on. Yeah. Let the kids internalize their own motivation yeah. rather than just pleasing people. I think over time, um, as far as motivation is concerned, uh, mm -hmm. something that I uh, um, feel about uh, motivating students is that you never know what's going to stick with them. You never know where, when there's going to be a click with the, the child's own motivation and what I provide mm -hmm. as an external stimuli. Yeah. So we want to continue to encourage them. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea is that God has endowed each child with a special gift. Mm -hmm. And we're really, really helping our students to seek and find what that is mm -hmm. and then continue to pursue that. Yes. Because that will become their purpose and mm -hmm. goal. But, but motivation is a, is a big topic. Um, mm -hmm. I think parents could often, as you, you, you said, you, I, I, th I, think it, I think for you, Pastor Ted, to talk about this is, is a painful experience, yeah. if you will. Yeah. But we don't necessarily uh, motivate our students well or children well. And sometimes you need youth pastors, maybe mm -hmm. grandparents, uncles, mm -hmm. other professionals, other parents and other teachers to really, really speak into them yeah. almost objectively without the parental bias. Right. So with the second one, I did better. Um, I insisted my older one pick a major and, and go. Well, my second son, also a graduate of New Covenant Academy, right. doing well, meaning he's making money and being you know, happy. Um, when he entered college, he entered as undeclared. And there's this Korean phrasing, tap tap he, right? Personally, I felt tap tap he. Man, you should, you should pick a major, mm. but I didn't force him. Yeah. I let him go, and he was doing his general studies, and uh, the head professor of the accounting department and came and told him, hey, you have a knack for accounting. Mm. 
you know, you did a really good uh, job in, in, in the which accounting class. I would not think that that was his forte yeah. as a high school student. Mm-hmm. He, he, that's not his forte uh, that I would think that would come to the yeah. forefront of my mind. Uh, he's more social than anything. Right, right. And athletic. Yeah. So, so his professor started talking to him, and he wanted to do accounting. And I said, are you sure? And he goes, yeah. And um, he had a better GPA in college than here. Mm. That speaks to motivation. Over here, he was going to a school where his dad was involved, where one of dad's best friends was a professor at, uh, a principal of, and uh, he grew up here. He went to school here for 12 years. Uh, But once he picked up accounting, his grades improved. Um, He did really well. He didn't graduate at the top of his class, but pretty close, uh, which was really surprising. This sounds really bad. I hope John doesn't watch it because I didn't never consider him to be that academic. Um, but we never know yeah. when this internal motivation will mm-hmm. kick in yes. and become almost like a vision or the mm-hmm. uh, lifelong goal or, mm-hmm. or profession. Mm-hmm. I think that's why we just keep throwing certain opportunities uh, encouragement, mm. and hopefully that that will somehow click, mm-hmm. and that that's what the adults need to do. Uh, mm. No one should be saying I, I. I think when I have a conference with parents, one of the things that I mm. kind of cringe at is like when parents say, "I know my son, mm. I know my daughter. This is what they're going to do. This mm. is what she or she's going to do." And I'm no. like, ah. Maybe not. Maybe mm. not. Uh, so let's give them some opportunity and room. Yeah. But sometimes I don't get that uh, flexibility or open-mindedness mm. from parents. Well, conclusions to John's story. So he graduates with an accounting degree, gets a job as an accounting intern. Guess what? The company sees other potentials in him. Mm. says, hey, you'd be really good at human resources because you talk to people really well. So Social skills. Right. So he transitions to a, a job, mm. you know, after his internship was over, he didn't go to the accounting department. He went to the human resources department. And then he got some experience from there. And then he was recruited to a, um, a headhunting uh, firm where they specialize in uh, connecting accounting professionals to companies. Oh. So they said, hey, you have an accounting degree. Yeah. And you have human resources experience. Why don't you come and recruit people and place them in jobs? Mm-hmm. So, so his motivation even changed. His goal even changed when he got into his career. And um, he's done that, and he, he did his mm-hmm. role there. And now he's with the company where he writes uh, policies for hiring people, giving benefits wow. for people. So it... it it evolves. Yeah. Um, well, f- when we have students at our school, uh, K through 12 school, mm-hmm. uh, we may not see any of that. Right. 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 But we know that something like that will most likely happen beyond high school years. Right. So our goal is to motivate motivate our students to continue to do things that will benefit them down the line. Yes. So. Not the immediate gratification, mm-hmm. like gosh, I want to you know like play computer games for mm-hmm. five hours rather you know rather than four, mm-hmm. and and our students argue with their parents about that. Right. But what we're trying to do, and I think what we as all adults in their lives need to do, is to motivate them for what lies ahead, mm-hmm. and not immediate gratification, right. and continually and over time they will internalize it so we continue to provide the opportunities to mm. to find some kind of motivation that will click with their passion and interest and, and, and their right. purpose for life right. um, so and, and as, as I said as a Christian school our goal is to make sure that they find their God-given uh, potential mm-hmm. I think what's the famous saying that there's a day that the two great days in your life is a is a day that you were born and the second day is a day you realize what you were created for. Mm-hmm. And so hopefully those things will be something that they will discover over time. So as we're talking about the five elements of high achieving students, five elements of high achieving students, we said the first one was physical fitness. And the second thing is uh, having personal or uh, individual motivation. Now let's move on to the mm-hmm. third one. And this is more of a 
habit, in my opinion, than right. anything else, which is intellectual development or often what we refer to as study skills, mm -hmm. study skills. Um, when we have students uh, who transfer to our school from uh, other schools, typically uh, public schools, is that uh, they don't know how to study. Uh, they don't know how to study in the sense that, you know, they're asking for the parameters of the quiz or exam. Will this be on the test? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or is will the quiz cover chapter mm -hmm. one from page 20 to page 35? Right. Uh, well, yes, but you need to study what's in it. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for just who, what, when, where, and why. And then mm -hmm. we'll just stop there. Right. So we're trying to teach our students, especially like in high school and elementary school, and, and uh, upper elementary and middle school is about how to take good notes using mm -hmm. either Cornell system or other forms of note taking and reorganizing notes. How to use highlighters to, to <laughs> highlight what you're studying. Um, there was a book uh, that I read probably two, three decades ago, which is titled uh, the, uh, the Common Traits of 100 Highest Performing High School Students in Korea. Wow. Okay. That's a mouthful. Th that is. And when I read that, I'm like, wow, there's going to be something amazing in there. Guess what? The researcher found that the only commonality among all 100 students is note-taking skills. And they're almost same note-taking skills. They didn't only take notes, but they reorganized their notes and they mm -hmm. highlighted their notes. Right. So by the time they were studying for exams, mm -hmm. they didn't have to go back to the original textbook. They right. didn't even have to go back to the first set of notes that they made. Mm -hmm. They had these highlighted, indexed, you know, mm -hmm. pretty nerdy system where they, right. you know, like yellow would mean fact or like mm -hmm. blue would mean uh, dates or something like that. And mm -hmm. they had that in their head. Yeah. So uh, most of our students think that spending a lot of time over material is the right way to study, mm -hmm. but there is a system involved yeah. and they need to have that skill. Right. right. So study skills. Yes. Any comments on study skills? Yeah, study skills and habits, right? I mean, that's what, what we get. It. Um, and study skills are, skills are developed over time. Habits are developed over time. Right. So Repetition. Right, repetition, uh, our insistence in them taking good notes. Right. One of the things that we, we really focus on is kids not phasing out, right? We tell our teachers all the time, it's your job to also get them to engage right. and do things. One of the things, I don't teach a lot of classes. I, I teach Bible, you know, just one of the days of the week. And uh, I keep talking about myself, but one of the things that I do, I insist on is I'm always having a pen or a highlighter right. when they read. Absolutely. And I tell them, you know, go ahead and circle and underline every word, every phrase you think is important. And then after you read it, you examine those things to see what's important. Right. And, and the way I teach them is that when you read a paragraph, you should be able to summarize in one sentence in the margin so that when you go back to review it, yeah. you can read the sentences and it, you will remember and those words will remember. One of the things that I'm, I'm very proud of uh, is that that's what sets our students apart right. uh, when they go to college, that they can take notes, they're organized, they have habits, they have skills. Yeah. Um, one of the students that we're really proud of at our school her name is Mrs. He Miss, she's a Mrs. now, but Helen Park. Right. She actually taught our, our first elementary, grade. first grade here. For seven years, yeah, I think. Yeah, for seven years. <laughs> I used to use her note-taking and also her uh, uh, diary, uh, academic diary, as an example to the kids at the beginning of the year. She, when she was at school, and she didn't even know, because I kept her uh, thing I, with, with her permission, and what she had was, is that, like you said, she had color-coded yeah. uh, according to importance, right. right? And she had a, I forget how she did it, but she had a system where she could check off whether she did it or not. And this was something that happened when she was in school. One of the teachers said, hey, I didn't receive this assignment from you. Uh, and basically it became her word against the teacher, even though there wasn't an argument but they were perplexed. Helen turned it in, she didn't have it. But the teacher was able to accept the fact that she turned it in because she had this note that says, this is how I do it. Teacher, I, have, I had your assignment in green and there's a date here that I said I completed mm. 
turned it in. And it was far more convincing than yeah. saying, I think I did it. Yeah. So I'm really uh, uh, proud of how our students are better at that. So when they go on to college, I hear from kids, yeah. Pastor Ted, I'm prepared so well. Yeah. You know, my roommate is, they use words like an idiot or a dummy. They're not, obviously, but they just haven't had the opportunity of learning the habits and skills. Well, and, and that's what a college prep school should be doing, preparing <laughs> the students not only to get into college, but do well once they get there and thrive there. In order to thrive there, we kind of figure out what they need, the skills that they need, and we start practicing here mm -hmm. and start developing habits. Um, I think uh, this is such an underrated part of a, an effective student. I think sometimes people think that smart students have it all up here and they could somehow figure things out. No, you, you, you basically need a system. Uh, there, I don't know of too many CEOs. I know people talk about Elon Musk all the time. He's got a system. He's got a system, and we're going to talk about it uh, in, in his prioritization and time management. He's got a system of taking notes, system mm -hmm. of, of, of quantifying data, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that allows people to um, take care of and organize massive amounts of data and information. And we're living in an information age where we're, it's, we're flooded with details and information. Mm -hmm. And it's not okay for our students to say, well, I have it all up here. No, mm -hmm. you have to write it down. You have to organize. Mm -hmm. You have to have a study habit. Mm -hmm. and, and study habit isn't just about organizing notes. And, and, and um, that's one part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, most of our students have lost the art of good handwriting skills. Me too. Because we're all typing things right. out all the time. Yeah. Um, now, uh, with the AI and, and uh, ChatGPT and all of those, our high school and middle school teachers are going back in time, if you will, to, to uh, force our students to practice writing handwriting and, and doing um, uh, writing exams where they have to articulate 20, 30 minutes in a row. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I see in their first few minutes of writing is, they're cramping up because yeah. they don't know how to write and they have been writing. Mm -hmm. But we need to put this into practice. So mm -hmm. good handwriting. Mm -hmm. you, you ever notice that students write things and they can't read their own writing? Right. They yeah. write something in, and when you ask them to read off the notes and they're like, I, I know I wrote something, but I don't understand what I wrote. Yeah, <laughs> a, a com comedian uh, said something about Zen Z. I mean, our kids are not even Zen Z. But she said, you know, it's going to be easy to take the cultural word back from these guys because they, they are <laughs> illiterate when it comes to handwriting. Right. So write everything in, 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 cursive. in cursive and they won't and get they it. They won't, yeah. you, know, you know, if you strategize yeah. in, in cursive, they're yeah. not going to be able to code okay. it. Um, but going back to Elon Musk, um, one of my church member kids, he didn't go to school here, uh, but, you know, got his mechanical engineering degree and got a job at Tesla. Uh, and he was doing well for himself. And he, this is what he told me about Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk writes so many emails to so many people. Yeah. So he would get, he, and he wasn't even the upper level, but he would get a personal email saying, hey, so-and-so, this is, and that his thoughts and his organized thoughts, and he would write it in. So during one of the meetings, he had a session, ask me anything. So somebody raised their hand and said, hey, Elon, how come you write so many emails? We can do texting and all these things. He says, I write those emails, first of all, for me, so that I remember what I wrote. And secondly, for record, I can, it maybe it's not in my drive, the idea or the thought, but I can always pull up right. email and, and see what I did. I thought that was really interesting, yeah. you know, that uh, he had a, a forethought of why he writes so many emails. So his own system. Right, his, his own, own system, system. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that was, I thought, was really cool. Well, today we're covering the uh, five essential elements of high-achieving students, and we only covered three, and 30-some minutes have gone by. So mm -hmm. maybe what we need to do is uh, uh, talk about the next two, of the, the next time, next session. So right, I think that's So why don't better. we come to a closure here with the first three ideas of the, mm -hmm. of the five elements, which is one, physical fitness, and two, motivation, and three, intellectual development, or what we would consider having the right system or study skills. Yeah. And next time we'll talk about the other two factors, and I won't mention what they are so mm -hmm. that you could stay tuned and, and come back to watch this again.
Thank you. This is Dr. Saul of New Covenant Academy and also Pastor Ted of New Covenant Academy. Please join us next time for the second half of this podcast.